We are lean, mean, sports talking machines. We're also sick, but that's besides the point. Welcome to the first full episode of Three in the Key of this semester. I'm your host, Ben Allen. Glad we're now fully into the swing of things here around Media Crossroads, and I am glad to get the show on the road. Today, we'll talk about the future of the NFL, the Big 12, and have an interview with KJHK Sports Director Jackson Long. But before we get into all that, let's get you up to date on what you missed. It's been a rough couple weeks for the NFL and for the commissioner, Roger Goodell. Many have been calling for the commissioner's job following the lack of discipline and responsiveness in the multiple domestic violence cases floating around the NFL. Today, the commissioner will address the media at 3 p.m. Eastern time for the first time since last week. In that time period, three NFL starters have been inactivated by their respected teams for their roles in the individual cases. There is no indication that the conference will have any implications of stepping down, but there sure could be a few questions swirling on what the heck is going on. Jerome is no longer in the house for all of you Kanye West fans. Jerome Simpson has been cut by the Minnesota Vikings. Simpson was released shortly after ESPN reported that he had been cited for misdemeanor charges of weed possession and having an open container back in July 7th. He was already serving a suspension for drunken driving case from November and is suspend was suspended in 2012 for weed possession as well. Simpson is a free agent and any team is free to pick him up if they choose, but Simpson could be facing more legal problems as well as suspension. Here's something KU fans can smile about. K-State lost to Auburn last night 20-14. Coach Snyder of the Wildcats claims that the Tigers were stealing their signals during the first half. And as someone who was in attendance of the game last night, I can promise you one thing. The only thing that was going on was K-State shooting themselves in the foot the entire first half. K-State moves to 2-1 and one, and they will play UTEP Miners next weekend. The captain may have hit his final bomb. Derek Jeter last night hit his first and maybe last home run of the season in Yankee Stadium. Jeter, who will retire after the season, has nine more regular season games in his career, seven of which are at home. Likely Mr. October will not be in October this year as the Yankees are five games behind the second wildcard spot. And finally, a quick fantasy tip. When players are being suspended on your team, don't completely lose your grip. Oftentimes when players such as running backs go down to injury or suspension, their replacement can do just as well. For example, Niall Davis of the Chiefs had 22 points in a basic NFL league. These backups often carry the workload as your star player would and often are not game pl planned as well enough to allow a burst of points. These usual free agents are also good sell high players that will come back to earth once a defense adjusts after a few weeks. That's all I've got for fantasy tips and what you miss. But when we return, we will sit down with Jackson Long and talk about KJHK and KU football. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are now joined by the sports director of KJHK Radio. You can catch him on Tuesday nights? Uh, yes, Tuesday, Tuesday nights. nights on 90.7 mm -hmm. talking about the greatest sports topics. That man is Jackson Long. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, man. thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. We're just going to go ahead and jump into things about a little bit about you. Jackson, you, uh, you basically took this summer as an opportunity to go out and work, and you got the opportunity to work with WIBW. What was that like working as Sports and News? It was great because um, my, my internship the previous semester, uh, or the previous summer, was at Channel 9 in Kansas City. Okay. So big market, and I didn't get to do as much because, of the, um, because it's just a bigger place. And now being able to go into a smaller market, you know, and right away, uh, the sports director there, Jenna Corrado, was able to teach me camera and have me film for and do all the things, you know, stuff that went on air where, you know, that's a smaller market so I can do that in Topeka where in Kansas City I didn't have those opportunities. And now how has this semester been? Obviously you're really busy keep, keep, keeping, keeping everything straight with KJHK and now working with KUJH as well. What, what has been the semester's like, you know, plan for you so far with the radio station? Well, the radio, I wanted to make sure the communication was there so everything was, was you know, on point and, and there were no miscommunications, you know, people missing shows, stuff like that. And I think we've done a good job so far doing that. And, um, you know, we've had a couple football broadcasts, our second one, mm -hmm. that you can catch on 90.7 this weekend. A little shameless plug there. There you go. Um, you got to do it, right? And so, uh, but what it really, I just wanted everyone to have an opportunity to grow and get better and then to also increase the quality of our, our radio station and really kind of the exec school for KJHK was to bump into that top five radio college radio station right. and they're already ranked in you know in some places a top 15 
but being able to to really push the radio station, especially in my sector, the sports, to being a top five sports radio station. Now, what is the name of your show that you do on Tuesdays? We call it the pregame, pre uh, and we we had it from Wednesday of last year, and we actually brought most of the same crew back. Um, so we wanted to keep the same name, kind of keep the branding going, and, yeah, uh, and not change it up. So okay. Now, what is what's the show's basically like setup? Like, what does that show usually consist of? Yeah. Well, we like to do the segments and and, and have some stuff. Our producer Brendan Dorzinski does an incredible job. He's also the news director for KJHK. Okay. Um, but we we have you know like a an over under segment or fact of fi fact or fiction. Uh, fill in the blank, so you know, like Auburn's win over K State was, um, so stuff like that to keep it, really keep it going. And then you know, right now we'll hit up the Royals talk because you know it, it's yeah, pretty prevalent time. stuff. So oh, yeah, I so was ten games to go. It's going to be a tight race. It is. But let's move to football here. Obviously on campus, there's been a lot of swirling speculation that this game, even though it's going to be a non-conference game, is going to carry a lot of weight going into the season and possibly jobs on the line. If KU is to lose this game to Central Michigan, how hot does the seat get for Charlie Weiss? I don't think it's too hot. I'm a big fan of giving coaches three years, okay. um, and, and I think it's a full. They deserve the full. Charlie Weiss said in his press conference on Tuesday that he this was a very important game for sure. for the team, and it will set the table as far as if they win. It's going to be a good boost going into the conference, and, and they have a shot against Texas at home. I think Certainly. if they play well in this game, but then if they lose, then it kind of puts them in the direction of. Wow, you know, we need to squeak out one conference game, or may, maybe Ch uh, Charlie Weiss is out the door. Yeah, it's always a hot seat. What, what is the main problem for this team right now? I guess is it, is it the issues with the quarterback that we've been seeing for the last few years with Charlie, or is it something greater? Well, Weiss has always been a quarterback guy, which I think is the most interesting. Part Even though he this. runs the ball all the time. Yes, he runs the ball. And well, they've been successful for the last three years, so they should keep running the ball. But you know, he had his handpicked quarterbacks and Dane Chris, Jay Keeps. Both of those didn't work out. Montel Kozar, great athlete but so far hasn't developed quite as well as a passer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that his quarterbacks really haven't panned out in three years, which you know, in this league, in the Big 12, you got to throw the football. Do you think Kozart's going to pan out? I think that he deserves to get some time. This is his first full season as being thought of as the starter, so he had the offseason to be the starter. And you know, it's only game three coming up this weekend, so uh, I think you give him some time. So do you think they'll win? I do think they'll win. I think Central Michigan's offense fits well into what KU does defensively. Uh, they have a two tight end, two running back, kind of old school power football, and I think that's it's a change, unfortunately, because the rest of the Big 12 is not like that. Sure. But um, I think it fits well. I think KU will be all right this weekend. All right, good. So, is the the next question basically is it too early to talk about college basketball? You know, with KU, it never is. is it too here. early to move it never on to here it. Is in, in Lawrence. It's what, do never think, what do you think the team's going to be like this year? I think they'll have more swagger than they did last year. Mm. I think um, Cliff Alexander and Kelly Oubre are, are different molds of people than maybe Joel Embiid and, and Andrew Wiggins. Sure. And I think Wayne Selden will be a, a big leader and a big part of this team this year. Where's the team finish up this year? Um, Put you right on the spot before I, the season Exactly. Begins. I was just, say, just throw you out there really. right now. Um, I, would say, I would say they could make a Final Four run. I think they're that good. I think Duke's going to be really good. I think Kentucky's going to be obviously loaded year after year. but. You know, Kentucky's an experiment. One year they would make the NIT and lose in the first round. Sure. Next the year they win national the national championship. championship. Yep. So. Well, you've heard it here first, guys. Thanks for joining us, Jackson, but we're not done with you yet. That's right. We're going to send you over to the bar here in just a minute. And actually, not even to the bar. We're just going to send you to the green screen because, you know what, we're technical. It's college. <laughs> we're going to have an issue here. But anyway, thank you for coming on with us. We'll see you over in just a second. Absolutely. And we will see you guys in just a moment. You won't want to miss. Welcome back to Three in the Key. We are now here with our debate topic time, and we are here along with Jackson Long, Blake McFarland, and GJ Melia, all of guys from KJHK Radio. We are here back with the point system today for the debate, and of course, the points don't really matter, but we like to pretend they do. So we're going to go ahead and jump on in, guys, with our first topic of the day. If you didn't get a chance to watch the NFL last night and chose to watch college football, you may have missed, or seen for that matter, the fact that the Buffalo, not the Buffalo, Tampa Bay Buccaneers got blown the heck out by the Atlanta Falcons last night, in which that game, Devin Hester broke a big record last night with 20 return touchdowns. Deal or no deal, guys? Well, I'd say deal. That's, that is a very big deal. Devin Hester, 
I mean, Deion Sanders is in the Hall of Fame, not because he was the greatest defensive back of all times, because, you know, he had the swagger and he had the punt, punt and kick returns. If you watch that play, uh, Devin Hester does a tribute to Deion Sanders when he breaks the record. He starts high-stepping it, which was awesome. That's cool. I mean, he's one of the best kick returners of all time. He'll go to the Hall of Fame because of that, not because he was a wide receiver or DB, whatever he wants to call himself these days. Yeah, I think it's definitely a deal. And now what he has, he's the second guy in NFL history since, I think, the 60s to have a rush TD, a pass TD, or excuse me, not a pass TD, a receiving TD, and then a kickoff, punt return, and field goal return for a touchdown. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a deal too, guys. I mean, he literally made the Hall of Fame last night. He's, he's a lock now. And, and he's going in he's going first in the Hall or second fame. ballot. And, and I think the, D, the best part of the deal was the Deion Sanders part. I mean, uh, that, that's a cool tribute. And, and he's in the Hall of Fame now for literally – returning punts and kicks. So good for him. Good so for a guy who doesn't catch touchdowns on a regular basis is going to make it into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, he's made clearly an impact enough on the on the game that he deserves to be in. Well, put it yeah. this way, put it simply, if everybody else could do 20 touchdowns in a career in punt returns, then it wouldn't be a big deal, but nobody else can. It's why it's such a big play. It's why in fantasy you get so much more points and you get kick returns as opposed to just receiving touchdowns. Yeah, and no one's even come close to, to Deion Sanders and Devin Hester. Ditto. Yeah, what they, what they said. What they said. That's good enough for a point here. First point goes to Jackson. Yes. All right. Second question, guys. The NFL has had a very rough couple weeks, as we talked about earlier in the show. There's been a lot of suspensions, a lot of people being deactivated. Now the question I have for you guys is, is really just a simple one. Has the NFL hit its peak or climax with NFL fans as it being the best it's ever been? Well, I don't, I don't think so because we're all still watching. We're all fans, and we're all still watching, and, and the attendance hasn't gone down, and the ratings have not gone down at all. It's really the major companies that are really having a say in this at all, and I think it's the fans. The fans still love the, the product that the NFL has. Uh, it's too early to tell, obviously, if it's the climax or not, because, I mean, you know, as you can see with Adrian Peterson, the Ray Rice thing, things happen so quickly, but I think the bigger deal with this and the bigger issue going forward with the NFL is that they have this concussion problem. They have this criminal problem with some of their players. And the NBA loves it. The MLB loves it. And ESPN and CBS love it because eventually they're going to have to negotiate new TV contracts. And that's why the stories, these stories are so big is because they want that price to come down and the product will still stay the same. It's still the best drama in sports. Yes. You watch Sunday and you never, you never know what's going to happen. Anybody can win any given Sunday. There's great parody in the NFL and it's, it's gladiator fighting in a modern sense. I mean, it's the biggest, the baddest, and the fastest all playing in the stadium. I think it's it's the worst, uh, NFL's in its worst shape right now than it, it, maybe since baseball steroid era. And I think that um, it's that kind of negative light. And you've seen the attention in the media outlets recently. So I think this is as bad as football's been. But like you said, GJ, it's not going to change. It, it, people love football and the money's going to stay there. But, you know, these TV contracts may start going down as well. Yeah. It may sound awful, but sometimes people do like seeing things burn. I mean, you know, you kind of, you know, like it's kind of why why do people watch house fires? Where do they make the news? Well, people kind of like seeing yeah. things not literally burn, but just figuratively like, go down and you know fall apart. Yeah, yeah, none of the stuff that's going on is good news, no. but it is getting ratings. It, people are watching. People are paying attention. Any any publicity? Good publicity? <laughs> I, I think maybe right now is an exception a little bit to that. Um, and Roger Goodell, I'm sure, with you know people calling for his job. It might not be that, that way for him as well. Hard points and hard facts will get you the points. Blake McFarlane, you get your first point of the day here. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. The Royals now are a half game back of the Central lead. Who wins the Central, guys? The Tigers win the Central because the Tigers are the best team. They have the pitching when it comes around. David Price has been bad. The bullpen has been bad. But they still hit the ball, and that's how you win games. You hit the ball consistently, and, and, and the Royals can't do that. And I think that's the problem. When, when the Royals played really well in August, uh, they, they hit the ball, and, and I don't see that consistently going. This weekend will be a big series. It, they're half game back now, but don't forget that lingering Cleveland game where they're down 4-2 in the bottom of the 10th. So call it a full game back. If the Royals don't take two out of three, it's over. I, I mean, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't really know how to, if, as a Royals fan, I don't know how to see a division race because I've never seen it. But with the Tigers, they do have three Cy Youngers. They do have an MVP. But you know what the Royals also have? They have this like movie feel to them, you know. They had this. They had their montage in May, where like they're just, you know, it's kind of like if you watch a sports movie, like they have the moment where they're just doing really, really well. Then they have that moment where it's like, are they gonna make it? Are they gonna do it? I say they do do it. I mean, they have, you have guts going uh, Friday, you have Shields going Saturday, and you have Vargas going Sunday. I don't see those guys are, you know, Ver Verlander, Scherzer. It's kind of, it's kind of a wash to me. If they can hit, the Royals got it. And I think three games at home, they can take two out of three, have a one-game lead. 
you never know what happens with the baseball. I would take the Royals in the division. Yeah, it's really a toss-up right now. It's a half game. It's a full game, really, like you said. Mm -hmm. But if they can take two out of three in this series, it's really anyone's anyone's uh, division to have. And they don't have that tough of, of a stretch. They do face Chris Sale once at the end of the year. But the four games against Cleveland and the three against the White Sox, if they can take two out of three from Detroit, I think they can, they can take the, it. The Tigers also have Cleveland and then Minnesota. So I think that that's kind of but the don't sleep on Minnesota. They already lost to them. I, <laughs> I know, twice but yeah, I'll, take the, I'll take the 150 games prior to this as, as evidence that Minnesota is not that good. So I, I think the Tigers and the Royal schedules are a wash. It's, it's who comes out of this series this weekend. The biggest series in 29 years uh, for the Kansas City Royals. I like movies. You like movies. We all like movies. Movies wins the point. Blake, you get your second point of the day here. All right, DJ. <laughs> Going on to our fourth question. K-State almost beat Auburn last night. What does this mean for the SEC in comparison now to the Big 12? Well, I think it, it, it means that the Big 12 can still compete because K-State had every single opportunity to win this game. They had every single opportunity. They missed three field goals. They missed a 20-yarder, a 30-yarder, and a 40-yarder. They easily could have won this game by more than a field goal. And they, they turned the ball over in the red zone. They had a pick literally in the, in the end zone off of a sure catch by, a sure drop by Tyler Lockett. They should have won this game. And some people are saying that Auburn is the team to beat. They're one of the best teams in the country. And obviously, going into a raucous environment like, like Manhattan on a Thursday night, yeah. we've seen these games that Thursday night, that can be really bad for, for an yeah, a team uh, like prime that. prime time. I think I absolutely agree. I think that K-State was as well prepared and, and Coach Snyder had an awesome game plan and the thing is it's not about the X's and the O's sometimes. It's about the Jimmys and the Joes and they just didn't get it done um, and, and the field goals and, and some of the missed opportunities definitely were a cause. I think it says more about Kansas State than it does the Big 12. Um, I think Auburn's going to have a tough time repeating as SEC champs this year. Their schedule's bruder, uh, brutal. Uh, Bruder. Ole, 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 Bruder. Uh, Bruder. Bruder. Ole Miss and LSU. Um, of course, the game against Alabama. It's going to be really tough for them, South Carolina, on, on the docket as well. But I think K-State, you see, is, is just a, such a well-coached team that they're going to be put in the right position. It's can they make the plays. I think with Auburn, you can't underestimate the point that they went to Manhattan, Kansas on a Thursday, and there's hardly anybody in this world, no matter – no matter what the name of the jersey is, would be excited to go to Manhattan, Kansas, and play a football game. I know K-State's ranked, but, I mean, these guys, they have no idea where Manhattan, Kansas is. They have to fly into Kansas City and drive three hours to go to Manhattan. I think that does wear on Auburn. I don't think they played their best game. But you also have to remember with K-State, they may be a good team, but they're not the Big 12's best. And so what that says for the Big 12 is that you look at what West Virginia did with Alabama, what K-State's done against Auburn, and what Oklahoma did last year against Alabama – the Big 12 is not on the level of SEC from fan passion, from stadiums, from an atmosphere standpoint, but from a play standpoint, it's not on par, but it's just right below. And I think, I think that said last night, the Big 12 is one of the best Power Six conferences in the whole country, and it needs to be treated that way, which would, you know, if you're a KU fan. I would agree. I would if say you're a KU fan, you can say, you know, we're not the worst team in the country because we played probably the second best conference in the country. I would agree. I'd say second and Pac-12 is also pretty good, I think. I, I don't think the Big Ten's great. The ACC is really late, you know, down to Florida State. But, and Duke. Uh, yeah, and Duke, clearly. Um, but I, I think that, that you see that the Big 12 is really good, and Kansas, during this tough time, has had to go against some of the best years of the Big 12 uh, in the recent you know, past three years. Yeah. And much like basketball, there's no easy place to play, really, in the Big 12, minus Memorial Stadium, which is really easy to play. But, I mean, just like in basketball, like, K-State's tough, OU's tough, Oklahoma State. All these places are tough places to play. You can't take a day off. You, you really can't. And when you play nine teams, that makes all the other teams, you know, when you play everybody in your conference, that makes everybody better because you have to bring it each and every week. Yep. And props to the SEC and the Big 12 for planning this game because... Well, that was Ron <laughs> Prince. You know, pr props to Ron Prince for but, trying to screw up the guy who took his, takes his on job. Tuesday or Thursday night? Yeah, that's a, a Thursday night, ESPN. Yeah. Top 25 teams, no better, no better environment, no better place to play a game on a Thursday night, and I, it was a great scene. Uh, it, besides, besides playing in the conference, this is will be looked at as game of the year for or for K State. I mean, they oh, yeah. they got it going on a Thursday night. They had the national crowd. It was cool atmosphere to watch. It's a pretty typical K State happy game they would win. Though I mean, I've watched K State football almost all my life. I grew up in Western Kansas. All those people out there just adore Bill Bill Snyder. They think he's just God's gift to the earth. He's God's great. gift to K-State. He is God's sure. gift to K-State. But this is a game that they typically win. I mean, they played USC back in the day out there and just beat USC down. 
And I was fearful that K-State was going to go in there and just blow out Auburn, and you were going to have to hear about how great K-State is and how great Bill Snyder is just for the whole year. And that the fact that they didn't win might be a turning point for the K-State program. I'm not saying that they're going to get bad from this, but this is a K-State game that they win. And the fact that they didn't win, the fact that they got beat on the slug, a slant and go, that's just, you know, it's kind of one of those deals with K-State. Maybe, just maybe, Bill Snyder's just getting older and the program's yeah. not, it's not on that rise anymore. It's kind of coming down or, pe- or leveling out. Yeah. Props to GJ for getting his first point of the day. We are now at two, one and one for points. And this final one here is worth two points. Oh. ESPN recently did a survey that found that most fans believe that the Spurs are the best franchise in all of professional sports. Gentlemen, what is your favorite franchise in all of sports? Or not favorite, but the best in all of sports. The Spurs. Uh, I think they are the best. They have the best coach, in my opinion. Popovich has that team ready to go. The NBA Finals last year was one of the most entertaining to watch because you have the glamour and superstar. And I like LeBron James, so I'm not talking down here. But the Miami Beach, you know, South Beach type, type stuff, and you watch the best player in the game, Get, get it handed to him by the best team I've ever seen play basketball. That was an offensive machine with at an 100% efficiency rate. That was as cool as I've ever seen basketball be played. Yeah, and I, I think there's no real argument against the Spurs. You could make the argument that the Patriots had been, but they've dropped off and they, they've made a couple Super Bowls but haven't won them uh, since those that, that three out of four uh, in the early 2000s. But the Spurs have been the consistent since the Patriots got big in, in the late 90s. Uh, they've been consistent for 15 years with Tim Duncan, ever since Tim Duncan arrived there. And then they add up, and Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili. And then they're able to mold these guys, these Danny Greens, these D-League prospects that they mold into. Danny Green could have been the, the uh, MB, NBA Finals MVP in, 20, in 2012. Yeah. So, or 2013. And then get guys like Splitter that fit in okay, and then and, and, and guys that can shoot the three, and and all of a sudden you have a perfect team around the, the old big three, the the Manu and Tony Parker and Tim Duncan. Well, like any survey, there's obviously what well, the question is asked. If it's the best sports franchise in America, maybe. If it's the most likable sports sports franchise in the world, it could be the Spurs. But if you're gonna go the whole world, the whole sports world has to be Real Madrid. I mean, Real Madrid. Look what they do. They have this just stranglehold on soccer, which is the most popular sport in the world. They have some of the best players. They've been doing it for a long, long time. The Spurs are the most likable franchise. They have a lot going for them from that standpoint. But with Real Madrid, they have the world on lockdown. Everybody in the world likes watching Real Madrid. It's because the world loves soccer. And then my but they man. also do it so well. They they go out. They do something that the Yankees and those these big baseball teams that have they don't have a salary cap love to do. They go out and they bring in stars. The Real Madrid, they don't just go out there and identify a guy like, hey, we want Tony Cruz. They just go get him, and they bring him in, and they can take all those stars. And soccer is a sport where you, you can have 11 guys, but they don't have to be the 11 best guys to win the championship. And they go and they bring in all these guys, and they just make it work. Why is Kareem Benzema playing on Real Madrid? Because there's just this thought process of playing for Real Madrid is more than just playing soccer. I mean, that's why he's still on the team. I mean, they could have brought in Falcao, but they didn't because they know Real, because it just, it means something to play for Real Madrid. I, I, I disagree though, because I don't think that you can be the best franchise if you can just buy it. I think it's a management thing where you build a franchise, you have an ideal, you have like a vision statement, and you can't just buy your way into it. You have to, you have to scout and, and do things that are on par with the rest of the league. Real can do things that other clubs they can't do. They don't buy guys. They, they bring they in some do. of the they, best. They, I mean, they, they can't, you know, they also, you they can't, you can't build a team. You can't build an 11 like they can without buying them. They're they a New York Yankees type, they, type they, team. They the, I mean, of soccer, and so I think that you have to have. And again, Jackson, th- they're, not, not they're not on the same playing level. It's not fair for them. To but you, but other you, clubs. I, you, this question is just—I think this question is wrong. I mean, what are we asking here? We're we asking the best franchise because they have a mission statement. And they, you know, donate to charity. Well, and they, they, well they that's are, what the Spurs are. The Spurs but they're are the on the same. Likable. It's hard. Because I've never met a person that hates they have to the compete against other teams. And and Real doesn't so have to. Madrid. No, they 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 don't. They're not there's, the same. There's a team in the same country that they have to compete against. There's teams in other countries they have to compete against. Spurs have a whole league that has the same salary cap under the luxury cap uh, that, that they, makes, they, they have a harder job to become a better franchise than Real does. No, they that's don't. It, that's it. That's it. Most likable Spurs. Best franchise, Real Madrid. Well, <laughs> we finally got the debate going here on the last segment, and the last question is going to have to go to Blake McFarland for bringing up soccer. I think that's just a go-to Unreal. point for Wayne. Unreal. Unreal. Guys, I can't thank you guys enough for coming on. We hope to have you guys on again this semester. Tweet at us at tw- on Twitter. I don't know what I was saying there. Tweet at us at 3 in key to tell us what you think of the show today. Also follow us and get an update on what's going on. Follow these guys on Twitter. And make sure you tune in next week where we'll give you a KU football preview as well as a Skype interview. Thank you for watching today. This has been 
three in the key.